pleasure to be here and pleasure to be talking about this uh, little known topic and i cringe when i say little known because having read the book myself i i wonder why it is so little known right i believe it should be far more well known and uh, to introduce us to this uh, event this important very very important event or i should say events because many things happened uh, i have the pleasure of introducing monlumo kikon who has written uh, and researched and written this wonderful book on the siege of kohima uh, i first met monlumo just about 2 weeks ago uh, and i met him on his home turf i was in nagaland myself for a literary festival and we happened to be on a panel together we obviously got talking and i realized here someone who can really unpack uh, you know the uh, nagaland society and its history and its people and you know so many other so many other things that uh, many of us should know about but don't know about you know very very well so i'm going to actually start there rather than start with the siege of kohima right which is the subject of the book and the subject of the discussion today what i'm going to request uh, monlumo to do initially is to talk about nagaland naga history and the naga people you know to those of us here who perhaps uh, don't know that much and i believe that will give us the kind of opening to talk specifically about the events that he is written so eloquently in his book so can i request you to unpack nagaland for us bangaloreans i'll try that thank you kartik for um agreeing to moderate this session i also thank the bsc for giving us this space and for my thank all of you for coming to listen to this story uh you know i feel a little fearful because of the fact that most of you have read ramachandra guha or even manu pilai you know would have a little uh colored impression about the nagas and uh nagaland uh, because of um you know some of the books they've written especially manu pillai had written about uh, our uh, legendary fighter from nagaland called az pizo and he's painted him as a rebel i think guha himself actually wrote about him uh, in his uh, book on very elwin so these are um, some of the reasons why i was a uh, little fearful um i flew over uh, bangladeshi airspace to come here so uh, that's uh, by way of uh, geography before i get into the entire identity specifics of uh, our culture just you know i i like doing this i like situating uh, uh, nagaland from a very geographical you know uh, <clears throat> context or point of view the naga hills is uh, you know in between myanmar and assam or you know this part of india assam um, uh, during the colonial period was initially part of the uh, bengal presidency and later on uh, part of bangladesh was part of assam uh, especially uh, silet if you know about silet and uh, because of the ahom kings and their resistance towards the incursion by the mughals uh, the mughals couldn't reach towards that part of the region where uh, the nagas live today which is uh, part of nagaland uh, part of arunachal there are three districts in arunachal where nagas live and uh, manipur and then there is uh, equally the same uh, you know uh, area in myanmar and it's all contiguous so uh, there's this chief of a village in the border in uh, mon district of nagaland where uh, i took actually rajiv chandra shekhar by road and that time the road was a little bad so i thought uh, i had gone there long time back to mon from uh, dimapur where i stay so uh, we went by road i told him it's going to take only 5 hours but it took us 10 hours and he was very pissed off with me <laughs> for misleading him but that's a region uh, an area where he went and where he saw that a, in the chief's residence the bedroom was in india and and the kitchen was in myanmar so i mean just to give you a sense of uh, geography and location and it's uh, as it is 
Um, recently, there's this issue, you must have heard of the free movement regime uh, you know, agreement between Myanmar and uh, India being scrapped, or, uh, and a lot of discussions on it. So I keep wondering what will happen to the chief uh, at Longwa. Um, and and uh, in Longwa is inhabited by one of the Naga tribes uh, called the Konyak Nagas, uh, one of the most fearsome Nagas and also the last of the headhunters, as we call them. Uh, as, as late as 1994, and this was covered by the BBC fairly well, uh, they had a clash there in one village between the Konyaks and the neighboring tribes called the Changs. And Changs are not Chinese. It's a tribe in Nagaland. And a um, uh, few heads were cut, and it uh, gained uh, global attention because of that. So by way of uh, uh, you know, incidences like that, uh, we sometimes feature in national media, uh, especially uh, you know, where uh, the space for the margins in uh, mainstream media is very less. So usually we get attention when there is violence. So um, historically, I will just say that, you know, we, the Nagas inhabited this area called the Patkai Hills, the Saramati Mountains, <clears throat> in between uh, the northwest of Sagaing Division and the northeast of uh, Assam, uh, and, um, you know, uh, India. Um, and I, I really don't look at it as a northeast because the uh, British Empire, uh, uh, you know, officials during the colonial period actually named this region the northeast of Rangpur, Rangpur being at the north of Bangladesh. So uh, we now have the eight sisters called the, uh, including Sikkim, but um, initially it was only the seven sisters. And um, I say this because uh, Sikkim is above Rangpur again, you know, it's not northeast of Rangpur. So geographically we are located there. In the early, you know, uh, 13th century, when the Ahoms, or the Thai Ahoms, which came from uh, the Shan region of Myanmar, uh, came to uh, the Assam Valley, or the Brahmaputra Valley, they actually went um, across the Naga Hills. And of course, uh, there was not many battles that is recorded, but definitely there were skirmishes at that point of time and settled over Assam. Um, then I say this because again, uh, later on, there's this uh, Burmese force came to Assam and the Manipur Valley via the Naga Hills and uh, uh, defeated the Ahom kings. And then um, this was like early around 1820, 1826. Uh, between, before the signing of what is called the Treaty of Yandabu. So Nagas uh, are a distinct community there who practice um, jhum cultivation. Uh, before Christianity came, and even after Christianity came, there's a reported event in 1994, which I just mentioned, we were known as headhunters. I actually dedicated a chapter of, of, in my book on the concept, the philosophy, and the background and the history of how headhunting was practiced and what it means to the Nagas. Whether you can separate the practice of headhunting and with uh, the culture and identity of being a Naga. So these are um, inseparable sort of um, identity markers uh, for the Nagas. So for a long time, we, uh, we practiced animism. Uh, our own indigenous local faiths. Uh, in fact, even to this day, uh, that indigenous faith has been developed by one uh, fellow uh, called Rani Gaidilu, who was given the sobriquet Rani by Nehru himself because she fought against the British Empire. And um, it's called the Heraka religion. It still exists in some parts of Manipur, Nagaland, and Assam. Uh, but majority of the Nagas are Christians, because at that point of time, because we were wild, savage, and I use the language uh, of the British, I was using the colonial language about us and my ancestors. Not very flattering, but yeah. Uh, the policy 
of the British political agents at that point of time was we need was to contain the Nagas because they wanted to use that route which was used by the Ahoms, which was used by the British, I don't know, the Burmese, to go over across uh, the Naga Hills to Myanmar, especially um, um, to open new routes of trade with China and also to explore um, the vast natural resources in the Kabo Valley in uh, Myanmar. So that was the intention. And um, fast forward to uh, post-independence, uh, in, uh, Nagaland became the 16th state of India, independent India. And I'll just uh, locate that within some uh, historical, uh, you know, milestones. Number one, 62, as you all know, there was the, uh, let us say, attack and capture of a major power of Assam by China. It's called the 1962 war. In fact, I, a lot of, I meet a lot of people from Karnataka, you know, and uh, because they heard that I wrote this book and, you know, about the Battle of Kohima, uh, they'll say, oh, my grandfather went there, you know, for the F Second World War, for the uh, um, Battle of Kohima. And uh, even prior to that, my, uh, there were people who went there because those days, um, a lot of Indians served in the British Indian Army. So, and a lot of them came from here. In fact, uh, Raghu Karnat's book is about his personal memoir of his, I think, grand uncle who fought there. And uh, also uh, a lot of, I think um, there was a point of time when I was working in a publishing firm called Katha in Delhi, where I chanced upon several uh, books in what you call regional language. That was Kannada. And somebody had written about his time there in the uh, Naga Hills constructing roads. He was an engineer, military engineer. So a lot of people from here also went there. And uh, we have actually Nagaland state is carved out of the former Assam, uh, undivided Assam. In fact, uh, it does, therefore, I was, when I mentioned that Nagas are in Manipur, in Arunachal, in Myanmar, so it was just a small portion of the Naga areas which, we, which was given the state of Nagaland. But it came immediately after the, the Chinese aggression of 1962. We got statehood in 1963. But there was an active insurgency much before that. So since the 1929 uh, visit of the Simon Commission, the Nagas uh, or some elders who had gone to the, uh, as labor corps to the, uh, in, in the First World War to France, actually learned about, uh, you know, politics and uh, they came and wrote a petition to uh, the Simon Commission. So, uh, pr so from then on, a lot of, assertions by the Naga leaders for self-determination uh, existed. And in fact, uh, curiously enough, I mean, this for many people, they, you won't know about this, but there was an organization called the Naga National Council, which was headed by AZ Piso. Uh, chapter on AZ Piso is there in uh, Manupilai's book. You know, uh, it's very interesting read, and even for Nagas to read about. So they declared independence on the 14th of August, 1947, one day before uh, India's independence. So that was one of the genesis of the long drawn insurgency, which exists even to this day. Of course, uh, there's a ceasefire. Uh, there's a discussion going on for more than 25 years now uh, with the uh, insurgents there. But this is the part of the region which many people, because of the fact that there's not much covered in the media, um, not because they want to ignore this region, but would not even think about it. Today, there is a attention, a lot of attention being paid to this region because of certain narratives which are being uh, you know, introduced in the country at the national level that uh, for India to become a superpower or to be called a developed country. You know, its borders, its margins must develop. So at the center of uh, all this narrative is even the shift of 
uh, certain policies. For instance, the look is policy has been now transformed to act is policy. We will not just look, but we will act. So, I mean, that was the basis of uh, the, the renaming of the uh, look is policy to act is policy. So, um, this region um, in the Northeast is also for us very unique because unlike other parts of India, you have, you share a border with five different countries. And when you share a border with five different countries, there's always this issue of uh, border conflict. And uh, there are areas like our borders with Bangladesh where we have a clear boundary and uh, we are fencing the entire border. But there are areas like in Mizora, Manipur, and Nagaland where there is the, there was till a few days ago, the free movement regime. So we went and saw a uh, few kilometers from the uh, border which is manned by our uh, border security force and the paramilitary and, and, uh, and also the Indian Army. Uh, we see that the Burmese Army, the Myanmar military junda also has their posts. Uh, we can see from far, but it's not so near. So uh, there's a free movement regime uh, uh, that exists there. Nagas um, mm, inhibited this region even before the Ahoms. So that's one uh, aspect of our history which we always uh, uh, you know, point out because it's important in terms of who came first there. And we had a form of a village republic polity which was, uh, you know, uh, even among tribes, one village will fight the other. So our uh, even today, we would pride ourselves by calling ourselves, uh, you know, a warrior tribe or a warrior community. And uh, although those days we fought using the Dao, which is like a you know, longer version of uh, Kukri and a sm uh, slightly sm smaller version of a sword and uh, the spear. So that was our main uh, weapon. So which I mean, British. I mentioned the British political agents called the weapon of, uh, you know, uh, mass destruction <laughs> for the Nagas. So anyway, uh, um, our culture, uh, before Christianity came, and uh, uh, it was based on far, uh, just the few activities that we were involved in. Our fights were limited to fighting our neighbors, which is like the next village. And we were pretty much left undisturbed by the, you know, by civilization. So the first time that the British came was in 1832. So the British East India Company were interested in um, going to uh, Myanmar via the Naga Hills because they were going through Silcha which is like near, uh, you know, Bangladesh now, present day Bangladesh, Assam and Manipur. But they, fo they found out that it was, uh, the route was not so accessible and they wanted a shorter route. So that time, um, there was nothing to trade as uh, according to the uh, Britishers because they were in search of revenue and resources and uh, the revenue, the resources that were available were not the kind of resources that they wanted. So it's not teak nor, elephants nor, you know, slaves, uh, you know. So uh, the only treat that they did with the Nagas was sold. So we had a lot of sold depots and uh, they established one themselves uh, in, in Dimapur. Um, Nagas today inhabit mostly the hills called the Naga Hills and uh, ranging from, um, um, uh, you know, south of Nagaland, which is the hills of Manipur. To, if you know Arunachal, you know, it's a contiguous area. The Mon district is bordering, uh, it shares a border with Tirap, Changlang, and Longding district of Arunachal. So that's where the Naga community lives. And in Myan Myanmar, the northwest of the Sagaing division, not the entire Sagaing, the Sagaing division has Chin and other communities as well. Uh, so this is the area we live. And, um, after the British came, 
there were a lot of uh, skirmishes, a lot of battles, because you see, our concept is uh, we would not allow um, you know, uh, foreigners or other communities come and subjugate us. Even if we are defeated in a battle, temporarily. Uh, Anaga uh, warfare concept did not have the concept of surrender. You either kill or be killed. So that was the concept. So when the British came searching for a route, today you'll be surprised that route is the Asian Highway 1 and uh, National Highway 29. So, and that road was the road uh, used or uh, the main road which the Japanese wanted to capture. And that's how the Battle of Koima happened. I mean, I'm simplifying it. I'll get back into uh, that part uh, during the conversation. But so this uh, is a road which connects Guwahati to Dimapur to Kohima to Imphal, from Imphal to uh, More to Mandalay and then to actually uh, Southeast Asia. I've even uh, taken a road trip in Thailand uh, which, uh, where this road reaches. So there's a car uh, really organized by uh, the ASEAN and also uh, Government of India uh, from Kolkata to uh, Imphal to Mandalay to Thailand. So this road trip, uh, which is uh, part of the larger AKIS policy, uh, is on that lane that the Britishers built. So they actually uh, send a survey party, you know. So when the British East India Company came, their surveyors were also their uh, soldiers or uh, army, uh, army officers. And they came via, you know, you would think, imagine now that they would come from uh, Silchar to um, Kachar to Dimapur and go up to Kohima and go down to Imphal. But it's, it was the other way around. They went to Manipur via uh, uh, Kachar, yeah, and then came up uh, to Kohima. So on the way, they were, of course, uh, uh, resisted by the Naga warriors. Like, uh, you know, I always say this because I look at the term Anglo-Mysore War. You know, it's like there are three Anglo-Mysore Wars. It's not Anglo-Canada -Anglo War, Kanadiga War, or Anglo-Karnataka War, you know, it's Anglo-Mysore War. So we have, uh, we also use the term Anglo-Konoma War, because Konoma was the village which actually led the fight, and they also f uh, were instrumental in forming, a, um, you know, coalition of the other Naga villages against the invading forces. And because they used to go to Silet to trade in slaves and also salt. These are the only two things. And also uh, iron and steel, because we don't produce it there. Uh, and then uh, when the British East India Company came, they also uh, uh, traded in uh, you know, arms stolen from the British uh, you know, armory and all that. So this road was one of the main reason why the British, uh, you know, through their survey, established the political administrative headquarter in Kohima. But between 1832 and 1858, it took them, uh, 1878, sorry, it took them some 46 odd years to establish the political headquarter in Kohima. It took them time because every time they send their officers, the Nagas will kill them. Even after the punitive action by the British uh, you know, uh, forces, they will again uh, regather and uh, fight back and attack uh, uh, the Britishers. So a lot of British political agents were killed around uh, that period. So it took a long time. But it was a very brutal fight in the sense that they came, destroyed the entire villages, and the villages survived on the granaries they had. Every village had a granary. So you know they just burned down the whole granary. Villagers had to ex escape to the jungle you know, on the hilltop, you know, because they couldn't climb the hill, of course. Uh, the terrain was itself treacherous. So that was the period where the British actually um, changed their policy towards the Naga Hills. And I wanted to, uh, while writing this book, and by way of introduction to, to the entire uh, Battle of Kohima, I wanted to go back to that section of history 
where we proudly now say, okay, there was an Anglo Konoma war, you know, where we had defeated certain forces of the British Empire which came towards that region on our own without using the sophisticated weapons that they brought, you know. They, they used to bring, uh, uh, those days they used to use rifle, the Enfield rifle, and mortars, uh, I mean, small cannons, you know. Uh, but Nagas just had the Tao and the spear, and we fought. But uh, I think uh, it is a remarkable testimony of the uh, bravery of those uh, uh, warriors that they were able to withstand an empire for a full 46 years. So that was something remarkable. But anybody who writes about the region, especially the history of the region, would ignore uh, that particular area. They would, um, especially the, you know, um, I, I have friends from Bangalore who share the same sentiment as I do. You know, uh, British, both the East India Company and the British, uh, when the British ground took over, the British Empire, they had officers who were very bad at pronouncing our names, like Bengaluru was Bangalore. Like. So there was, you know, for a lot of people, people, even among the Nagas today, they don't know that there was no Naga word called Kohima. And we sort of uh, uh, talk about the Battle of Kohima. A lot of British war historians and British journalists or descendants of, um, you know, British soldiers who died there or fought in the Battle of Kohima write about the Battle of Kohima. And with such, uh, you know, valorization and glorification of the British army, that people now reading it will think, and there are some people who are confused as well, that actually it was the British who won the war, uh, uh, you know, at the Battle of Kohima. And it was the British, because of their own bravery, because of their own ability, defeated uh, the Japanese at, that, uh, at the Battle of Kohima. What I wanted to do was, uh, uh, you know, from because it was not our war, it was their war, but it was fought in our place, and it was fought, uh, you know, at the cost of the natives, especially in this case the Nagas. So I wanted to write from the perspective of uh, the native. You know, I also wanted to highlight how uh, the first American military engineering service came, and the the U.S. Uh, Military Engineering Service actually improved the railway line in uh, Assam, and you know Dimapur benefited out of it. So when the Japanese uh, planned their attack, uh, they thought they'll quickly take Kohima, go down to Imphal and uh, Manipur, and uh, cut off the supply lines of the British, and from there they'll advance to the rest of India through Dimapur. Uh, and and uh, if you, I want you to remember that at that period, the British Empire was on the wane, on the decline. When they first came, they had won so many wars against Napoleon, against you know, uh, so many great empires against Portuguese, the Sp Spanish, the French, and they were the height of its uh, glory. So when they first came, uh, they were able to conquer places which the Mughals could not come. In fact, the Battle of Saraigat, if any one of you go to Brahmaputra in Assam, where the Battle of Saraigat was fought, you would also see the terrain. It is an impenetrable terrain. From this side of the you know, uh, Bengal, you cannot actually go unless you uh, use the steamer, which the Britishers used. Uh, but the Mughals could not cross because they fought in small boats, you know, canoes actually. They didn't fight in big ships and all that. Uh, in uh, Saraigat, you know, by the side of the Brahmaputra. Now, I mention this because the Mughals could not come. The Ahoms actually had a far better policy of uh, living in harmony with their neighbors, the wild neighbors. They were able to establish uh, trade posts and uh, also a marketplace. We call it Ghat now in uh, Assamese, but uh, then it was established so that the Naga warriors will not come and attack them randomly. So there was a uh, fair, fairly developed um, practice of trade with the Nagas. The British continued that, but they actually came uh, 
to take over that route only. They were not interested in the Naga Hills, as I said. There was no oil, no coal, you know, and uh, no tea was found in Naga area at that time. So once they found, they were uh, interested in protecting their uh, uh, business interests, coal, tea, you know, especially. But the Nagas uh, were fond of raiding their tea gardens, their you know, so-called subjects at that point of time, and taking away whatever uh, the Nagas could after an attack. So that was something which, again, uh, sort of irritated and provoked the British. And they started uh, formulating a policy. They were initially saying that we will not interfere in the uh, affairs of the hill, hill tribes, the wild tribes, the savage, and all that. But ultimately, they were compelled to do that. So that part um, actually shaped um, the entire region into a political entity. So coming back to uh, their inability to either uh, pronounce our names, or perhaps it is a policy of the British officers to mispronounce our names. <laughs> you know, I, I always think so, because it's not so difficult for me also, you know. I was just uh, telling her how to pronounce my name, and she could do it at one go, you know. It's not so difficult, you know. Um, uh, it's much more difficult for me to maybe pronounce uh, somebody's name from here, like I can't Kembe or Gouda or Gouda. <laughs> so I have problems. Maybe Britishers had a uh, lot of problems. Kohima. Battle of Kohima. Before you actually look into it, I wanted to look into the origin of the word Kohima. So there's no word Kohima in the Angami language because it's, uh, it belongs to the Angami tribe. The, you know, Kohima Village Council calls it Kehui Ra, or, you know, uh, and they have a different meaning for it. But because they could not pronounce that, you know. And, and the other thing is, I want to come back to this because Konuma, actually there's no, it's a village which challenged the mighty empire, British empire, you know, because for the natives, they didn't know that the British were a great force. I mean, they didn't care that you are a great force. You are an enemy, you are invading our uh, home, so we will fight back because that's our culture, that's a way of life. So there was a fight which ensued and uh, Konuma, Actually, uh, by the natives were called Kunoria, but they could not pronounce Kunoria. So I tried, you know, using the British accent on Kunoria. It doesn't come out as Konoma, you know, so I'm perplexed. <laughs> but anyway, we uh, are a community which uh, privileged oral tradition over the written word. So uh, till the missionaries came, we didn't know how to read and write. So that doesn't mean that we didn't have a culture. So um, we didn't have issues with that, you know. And then um, the tribe itself, I mean, just giving one example, every Naga tribe today, under the constitution of India, you will find, okay, I belong to the Lotha tribe. So they will say Lotha Naga tribe. So that's my scheduled tribe status. But if you ask any Lotha, what is the meaning of Lotha? Does it, uh, is it indigenous to your community? I mean, we don't have the word Lotha in our uh, language, you know. It is the name given to us by the outsiders. So what the British did was, they would usually come and ask the first point of contact, what is your name, what do you call your neighbors? Sometimes the neighbors and the uh, community that uh, they want to know the name of, usually, you know, had some conflicts. So in this case, the Angamis used to attack uh, uh, the next door uh, Nagas called the Zemes, Zilians. And uh, because they come, they attack them, they take away their granary and all that. Uh, some people as slaves. So the, the Zemes said, oh, they are thieves. You know. Ngamai, you know. And because the Britishers could not again pronounce Ngamai, they called them Angami. But Surprisingly, unlike, uh, uh, say, in Karnataka, you know, Bangalore has been changed to Bengaluru. We have not changed Kohima to Kehuime or Kehuira or, you know, the original name. So we've not actually reverted back. So I feel that we still have this uh, sense of not being bothered about what you call us. You know? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah, so I think... <laughs> 
uh, uh, that way there is some similarity and this similarity. Of course, the uh, pride we attach to what we now call the anglo konoma War is uh, something we still, uh, you know, is still, I think, similar to what you have here. And when Nagaland got statehood, it was right after the Chinese had come till Tezpur in Assam and left for you know, uh, China. They had, see, they claim uh, Tawang as South Tibet. But when in 1962 they came, they didn't, uh, they actually came till Tezpur. They didn't occupy, they just left. Of course, the war was not over because of their occupation. Uh, at that time, they had come and left and the war ceased to, you know, um, I mean, by that point of time, there was, the war was over. And uh, after that, a lot of policies were there where, uh, you know, states like Nagaland was created. So at that point of time, Nagaland as a state was called the first state created out of a political decision. So it did not have the basis of language or, you know, history um, that is associated with a lot of other states in India. So that's one of the states, uh, one of the reasons why uh, Nagaland state was created. It was a political decision. And there was a um, attempt since 1947 to have, um, a, you know, negotiation with the rebels, as they call them. Uh, it's fully recorded. I don't want to get into that. But I just mentioned this uh, to highlight the fact that it was not a place where we had relative peace. First World War, before that, uh, since 1832, there was a violent onslaught on the place and a lot of British officers were killed as well. A lot of Nagas died. A lot of Nagas were imprisoned and punished, uh, you know. But Unlike other places, there was uh, no real acceptance of the authority of the British. So this question will come later on because in the Second World War, in spite of the um, um, treatment given to the Nagas by the British, the Nagas sided with the British uh, Empire yeah. in the war against the Japanese. So people keep on asking me and asking a lot of our scholars, why did the Naga side with the Jap uh, Britishers? Uh, initially, they sided with the Japanese, but they didn't think that their places will be bombarded. Uh, in the, the whole of Kohima, it was just a mere hillock at that point of time, <laughs> but it was just bombarded to ashes. And if you see the pictures, you'll be surprised. I mean, even the trees were gone. Plans were gone, everything was gone. Today, if you come to Kohima, Kohima is a beautiful city. It was uh, like Bangalore before we had, we still have the natural air condition in Kohima. I, I don't think it's, it's very cold, uh, hot even today. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, besides that, you have, uh, its population is less. It's capital of Nagaland state. But the main physical feature that stands out in the city of Kohima is the Kohima War Cemetery, still maintained by the British uh, War Graves Memorial. And they, in their own um, War Army National you know, uh, Museum, mem uh, they, they, uh, British National Museum, War Museum, sorry, has considered and selected this Battle of Kohima as the greatest battle the British ever fought. So I went to London also and I saw that they had a big memorial, you know, of the same thing they had in Kohima. And they pay for the upkeep there. If you go visit that, you will find that on the top of, above what is called the tennis court. They had a tennis court then. So in the 1940s when they came, the British political, deputy commissioners, as we call them, we still use that deputy commissioner. Unlike other states of India where they use district magistrate, DM, for the IAS officers who come. Uh, we still use that uh, deputy commissioner. We still use the British uh, lingos. Extra assistant commissioner is the first point of entry for a Nagaland civil service officer. And um, above that tennis court, you will find uh, the memorial plates of 
soldiers who died in the war. The entire first uh, top, uh, you know, on the left side, the top uh, memorial on the top is the are the names of uh, soldiers from Pakistan, now Pakistan. Then it was not Pakistan, right? So I was just worried. I mean, I was just wondering, you know, uh, how many Nagas died in the war? And I looked around, and I saw only one memorial of one Naga officer and one Naga soldier there. And there was also another uh, memorial plate of one Mizo, uh, uh, you know, soldier. Although a lot of Nagas and Mizos died in the war and uh, were instrumental in ensuring that the Japanese were defeated, the entire you know, pantheon of literature that exists today on the Second World War and the Battle of Kohima especially, does not include the stories of the local. So herein I want to document certain, you know, one is like representational, but there's a story of a Naga general. Because those days there was no Nagaland state, no Mizoram state, you know, the, the, the British Empire uh, started what is called the Assam Rifles. So Assam Rifles uh, actually took in um, uh, you know, youth from all communities, Kasi, Garo, Naga, Mizo, you know, Tripuris, you know, and they were enlisted there and they were uh, used for fighting everywhere, especially in the Burma campaign. And um, this uh, fellow, who I call the Naga general, because later on, after his retirement, he joined the rebel forces and <laughs> Became a general in the army. He was a soldier, actually. He, he was a soldier, actually. He was a trained soldier. soldier. And um, he participated in the uh, Battle of Kohima. So one morning, he was part of the Assam Regiment uh, at around 3, 4 a.m. This was told to me by his son. Um, he attacked the Japanese uh, camp. And so how did the Japanese get there? I mean, See, they came from when uh, was this? Myanmar. When did this happen? So this is like, it was a three months of daily war. Um, and in the year 1944. And uh, uh, they came on, uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting. Today, if you ask anybody from, um, you know, North India, they're like, very interested in the date, 4-4-1944. That's the date they came. The Japanese came. The Japanese came. Ka, via and, Myanmar. Yeah, yeah, via Myanmar. So, and, and they walked, actually. So there was a, actually, if you look at that time, and, and, and I'll get back to that, but if you look at that time, the generals who came, 31st Division generals of the Japanese Imperial Army, had problems of strategy uh, and, and uh, uh, approach. Among themselves. Among themselves. Right. Because the, so they were not agreed on. They were not point. agreeing on. Because the Japanese, uh, I think at that point of time, the Japanese Imperial Army could not or will not, you know, uh, they also don't have the notion of surrender. Right. That, that they, they came uh, primarily driven by the concept of Bushito. You know, so they, they, they didn't have the concept of surrender. So they the came, Japanese warrior. The Japanese code. warrior also. So when they came, they thought they'll easily take over Kohima. And so they rationed, and, and, and I think they were not having enough uh, there as well, because they were spread thinly all over Myanmar. Burma at that time was being attacked, and um, they were losing out in uh, other places in Southeast Asia. So I think um, they actually planned it wrongly, in the sense they didn't plan it well they had less ration. And they, their ration was meant for only a certain amount of days. And there was a tactical, you know, uh, I mean, debate on the you know, tactics between the two generals. One is famously known as Lieutenant General Kotuku Sato, who came to Kohima, who was the main uh, general the commander there. there. And then uh, uh, General Mutakuchi, who was posted in Imphal, who was the overall commander. So in the Japanese, uh, you know, the military lexicon, they don't have the concept of surrender. He was the first Japanese army to actually surrender and retreat. 
because he wanted to save the lives of, uh, of his men. Of his men. So both civil and military um, um, personnel of the Japanese Imperial Army died, and uh, it is recorded now that at least 20 to 30 percent of Japanese soldiers who died in the entire Second World War died in the Battle of Kohima and Imphal. Yeah. I see. So I mean, uh, for them, uh, even now, you know, they come to Kohima because they are. They also have this concept, like the Nagas, that you know, when you die, you have to be buried in your own village. Otherwise, your soul will not find peace. So they, are, they have funded a project after, I think this was uh, uh, followed up uh, more aggressively during Shinzo Abe's time. Um, uh, they, they send people to search for the bones of the Japanese soldiers. And this in Kohima. in Kohima, yeah. So they dig, uh, and just Kohima and around the entire battle. Because when they were going back, a lot of people died not in the war, a lot of Japanese died uh, due to the hunger. And, you know, uh, when on the way back they were killed by this or that, uh, but not in the war. So right. it was hunger sometimes. Now, I want to ask you a very yeah. specific question, and you mentioned it in your book as well. When the Japanese came, right, and now obviously they had these grandiose plans to take over India and they were coming from the east. In Nagaland, they did try to play the race card, didn't they? I mean, they tried to tell the local tribes that, you know, we are, I mean, I hesitate to use that word, it's not uh, politically correct anymore. We are both Mongoloid people and we should fight the white man. But it didn't quite work, or am I? I mean, you're right, but the larger question is, at that point of time, uh, the Nagas were not uh, under one political unit. There's no political organization which would claim to represent the entire Nagas or had uh, consultations with all the Nagas. So when they came, they used that card, that we are of the same Mongoloid stock, you know, you should help us. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it was exposed very, very soon. I mean, they even printed, you know, the Japanese rupee to be used as currency. And they taught a lot of uh, uh, Naga villagers the Japanese language. So if you, I mean, some years back now, some of them have died. Those who learned the language and could sing Japanese songs, if you go and meet them, they'll <laughs> sing it for you. I mean, uh, little post they remember. Yeah, yeah. So they did everything they could to actually uh, assimilate the Nagas into their fold, uh, to, um, let, uh, to actually engage the Nagas in, as porters, as labor, laborers, as guides, and all that. So they were paying, but you know, like I said, the war, they didn't expect the war to stretch on for three months. So the rations were off. So once the rations were off, they realized that they're hungry. They want to, <laughs> they, they want to eat, but there is no money. And, and why did it stretch for three months? The siege of Kohima, you said, stretched for three months. Um, because of resistance of the British, no, the, the terrain itself was something they did not take into consideration. They, the didn't, they, they didn't think that the terrain would be so difficult. Right. And, and those rations that they were bringing on elephant bags and all that. They, uh, the ration actually finished, I mean, half of the ration finished before they reached Kohima. Okay. So the first, actually, 15 days of battle was uh, successful for them. They were able to uh, take on, uh, you know, three different posts which were occupied by the British. They were able to drive them out. But again, at that point of time, if you remember, I mean, people from Chennai will remember that their air, uh, you know, uh, force did not have enough aircrafts to send, uh, you know, uh, to provide, yeah, to provide, and also to support, uh, you mm. know, tr the the Americans, on the other hand, had the entire uh, air support, which they gave to the Allied forces there. So if you remember in um, 1942, I think, there's this place in the eastern Himalayas across uh, Arunachal today. Mm. Uh, they wanted to send supplies to Kunming so that the Chiang uh, army could fight the Japanese army there. So they built a lot of um, air, helipads, actually, air, airstrips in Assam, upper Assam. Which, if you go there, they're, they're still there. They're still there, yeah. So they actually flew the supplies from there to uh, China. China. And, and if you know, they, they, they were already exploring oil there. 
So both oil, coal, all the necessary fuel was uh, taken from uh, Assam. So the resources that the uh, British had uh, actually exploited was also used in the war. Um, and then the Japanese army had, from right from the beginning, there was a, as I already mentioned, there was a, I mean, argument between the two main uh, commanders. Two top people. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when you have that atmosphere, you know, it's very difficult. And there they underestimated uh, the Nagas mm -hmm. because of two reasons. One, uh, Subhash Chandra Bose. Second, uh, our, that NNC leader, AZ Piso. So AZ Piso was based in Rangoon. Subhash Chandra Bose had already committed uh, the Indian INA his INA to uh, support the Japanese. Right. So actually the soldiers loyal to Subhash Chandra Bose had come till Imphal. And uh, till, uh, I think some of them came till Kohima as well. And Piso that time was a Naga leader, but he, he, had not, he did not have the support of the entire Naga community. He could not command the support. So later on he could. But uh, that was uh, post-independence, uh, you know, period. Right. So before that, he could not. So although Japanese depended on these two guys, uh, they, they could they not get the he, They would be no over the Nagas and then... Yeah, I mean, there was a general... Because the whole Indian... The, the atmosphere in India was different. There was a Quit India movement. There was right. a, a strong sentiment against the British, you know. So that uh, anti-British anti uh, movement was going on. I mean, it was at the fake end of uh, their stay here anyway. They were going anyway. So they, ex they expected that the entire uh, Naga community or the co uh, communities in the Northeast will support them. And they so were I mean, assured in by... A, in a sense, uh, they probably didn't get their history very right. In the sense, the... Perhaps, okay, the Nagas were in a tentative peace with the British, really. They had not been subjugated in their minds. You know, they had they perhaps stopped fighting. And the Japanese expected that uh, the Nagas will now side with them. Whereas, if they had actually studied the history and the psyche of the Naga people, like, the Naga people are fiercely independent. They're not just going to side with anybody. They're going to look after, you know, their own home and their own uh, geography. That's precisely it, isn't it? I think uh, at the center of the entire discussion, you see, the Japanese, I said, underestimated Nagas, but if you look at it today, you know, uh, they were listening to leaders of these communities who were telling them stories or their narrative was aspirational, you know, and, mm. and uh, it was It wasn't about, on the ground reality. It was on a, not on the ground reality. And um, the other thing was, uh, you know, they, they also had a, um, I mean, I think false misplaced belief in, in those uh, promises made to them. Right. Yeah. So I think, uh, I mean, of course, if they had taken over Dimapur, and the, if at the, in the discussion in Tokyo, the discussion was to take over Dimapur, not stop at Kohima. So there was actually, you know... But they couldn't of, get to Dimapur at all. They would have if they had not stopped in Kohima. Why because, did they stop in Kohima? I mean, the decision was taken in Tokyo that they will take Kohima, cut off the supply line of the British to Imphal. So that is their understanding of what should be done. And uh, if they had, instead of stopping in Kohima, because Dimapur was just there, taken over the Dimapur airport and the railway, railway station, station. They would have gone all over India because, you see, when the refugees came from uh, Myanmar, when the anti-India uh, campaign in uh, Myanmar happened and a lot of our people had to fly, uh, flee, so they had to, the only land route for the general mass was uh, through the Naga Hills, treacherous, uh, you know, trekking uh, and uh, terrain. And many people who reached Kohima, because of the British and the Nagas, were able to nurse back their health and they used this uh, railway station in Dimapur to go back to their respective places. So this was already there, but they did not think of it properly. So they didn't plan well. So I think in the, you know, because also they were under a lot of stress, pressure. 
they were losing wars. And, and the Burma campaign, uh, they had already lost the uh, Arakan, you know, state. state. So I think uh, because of that, and because of the pressure they had, because of the ideological differences or tactical, you know, logistical difference between the commanders, I think the main reason was that. But when their ration got over, they started snatching away the ration of the Naga villages. They so started the race car killing didn't their, matter anymore. Their race car was like, it ended there. <laughs> <laughs> Food was more important than race. <laughs> So the Naga started actively supporting the British uh, and the light forces as porters, as stretch bears, or as guides, as soldiers, you know. It's just that, you know, we will not win the highest uh, gallantry award in, in the British Army because obviously it's an irregular force. It's not the, not the British Army. soldiers. Exactly, yeah. And many Indians who won the gallantry awards also, you know, it's because of the officers who commanded them. Because most of the officers were, of course, all the officers were British then. Um, so the Naga contribution to the Battle of Kohima, I think, is, 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 is pretty much a forgotten history, more or less. I mean, up until now, I'd say. I think, in, 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 I think as far as the whole of India is concerned, I think it's just not, not just the Nagas, you know. If you look, if you ask anyone about Assam, many people will be confused. Uh, forget about the geography, you know, the history. And uh, most of the history we read are of uh, the ones that we see in our school textbooks about North India. And even to the extent that Southern Indian uh, histories are also less known to people like us, you know. Uh, till Manu Pillai wrote, till, uh, you know, this... Because I don't think even uh, Ramachandra Guha wrote about the you know, history of South India that extensively as he has written about um, Mahatma Gandhi. So right. recently, a uh, lot of scholars have come up. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned Manu Pillai and uh, the Lords of the Deccan by uh, Anirudh. Anirudh Kanisek. Yeah, Anirudh Kanisek. It's, it's a fantastic book. I mean, for us, it's educational. And we know that uh, this part of the world uh, had a interesting, far more you know, exciting history than the ones that we are fed, uh, you know, generally. So I think until um, even even Assam is a very exciting history. It's it's an area where uh, Mughals could not come, but the Britishers had uh, penetrated, and um, you know. Before 1935, I think Burma and uh, India was under the same government. Right. So uh, till that period, from 1826, it was a long period, more than 100 years, actually. So one last question yeah. before I throw it open for questions from the audience. Now, uh, you've been very upfront. You've called the book His Majesty's Headhunters, right? Um, you haven't tried to kind of... Uh, be uh, given euphemism for that part of your history. So, I'm, I, therefore, I don't hesitate in asking this question. What was this headhunting, the position of headhunting in Naga society, uh, you know, before maybe the missionaries largely brought it to an end? Why, why, this, uh, why this focus on hunting heads? If you could just briefly talk about that. Yeah, I mean, because I was writing this book, I uh, uh, looked into a lot of uh, the anthropological aspect of headhunting. And um, sometimes, because it's, for us, it's taboo to talk about certain aspects of our culture. But I felt that I think it's time that we discuss uncomfortable truths because it affects our identity. You know, there was, I went to jail and somebody said, are you still a headhunter? You know, somebody was asking me. <laughs> I think there is the instinct. I tell the story of a senior of mine who was in the uh, second Rajputana Rifles, and he was a Naga. He was my senior in college, and he was a Christian. You know, as a Christian, uh, the very clear instruction is in the Bible: "Thou shalt not kill." He was in the Indian Army. He was a captain. He was in uh, second uh, Rajputana Rifles, as I mentioned. And during the Kargil War, he was in the Dras sector, and unless you took that hill. Uh, 16,000 feet in the Dras sector, you would not be able to push back the Pakistanis. And he was commanding that uh, part particular section. Uh, I forgot the section. And he was awarded, anyway, the second highest gallantry award, Mahavir Chakra. He went up barefoot in the night with a kukri. I mean, he didn't have the Dao, but 
also with a gun, but he had carried a kukri. So with the, when he shot the uh, Pakistani soldiers, shot two of them, then I think he just threw away his uh, gun, took off the kukri, and started attacking them. So single-handedly, he just captured that uh, post. And he went up barefoot, according to the, uh, his uh, soldiers. And he was shot in the abdomen, so he died later. Uh, posthumously, he was awarded the Mahavir Chakra. So I was thinking about him. He was my senior in school, so I was thinking, oh, the instinct of using the ta kukri, you know, to cut the head is still there. But it was so embedded in our culture that it actually, as I said, we cannot separate that practice from our identity. In our culture, if in a war you don't take heads, the war has no meaning. Number one. Number two, we believe that the soul of the human being resides in the head. So if you don't take it, we cannot capture just the body. We have to capture the soul. And this is the practice. And number three, as a young man, it's the rite of passage. If you don't kill or cut a head, you are not accepted as a man in the society. You cannot marry. You so cannot marry? You cannot marry, yeah. So a lot of such, you know, legends or uh, practices. Uh, I mean, I mean, the entire reason why head hunting is very prominent and why it is, uh, you know, one of the most important marker of our identity is because of that past we had. So today, you know, to think that I would have to kill and cut somebody's head to get married <laughs> is unimaginable. So I mean, by way of explanation and disclaimer, I'm not a head hunter. I don't head hunts, but yeah, <laughs> that was our past. So we cannot ignore that past. So it's a truth. It's a fact of our, you know, identity. So yeah, that's why I use the word His Majesty's head hunters, because at that point of time, wittingly or unwittingly, there was both uh, a male ruler in England and Japan. Emperor Hirohito was there. There was a king there in uh, England, you know. So were any Japanese heads hunted? In yeah, the, many heads were. They yeah, were? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that general who I mentioned in my book, uh, there's a whole chapter to it, actually cut off all the heads. He didn't use the gun. It's in the wee hour of the morning. So he went and killed around 78 heads in one day. And he survived. He didn't die there in Kohima. I see. So, you know, it's not recorded by some of the military history of, uh, sure. the, uh, you know... But it British. has been preserved in oral narrative. Yeah, oral narrative is there, yeah. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, I think that was a, an extremely informative and eloquent crash course on Naga history. <laughs> I don't think we could have asked for anything better. I, I hope I'm speaking for all of you. We couldn't have asked for such a detailed, such a precise narration of this very important aspect of our history. And I'd like to throw the floor open for questions. You know, I think uh, if you have questions about Naga life, Naga history, Naga people, uh, you couldn't have found a better person to give you the answers. <clears throat> Can we start here, and then we'll come to you? Oh, yeah. Please, yeah. Uh, there was uh, some kind of conflict between the Indian army and the insurgents. Can you shed some light on that? See, this conflict has been going on since I said that uh, when some Naga leaders would participate in the First World War in France and came, came back and, um, um, and uh, wrote to the Simon Commission that we are a unique people. We have never been subjugated. And India has never defeated us in any war to claim our land. We want to declare our independence. <laughs> so that was the you know, uh, genesis. genesis of the entire conflict. So in 1963, uh, realizing that and recognizing that we need to uh, have this, because if you look at it now, a secure border is a secure nation. <coughs> And then at that point of time, the con Congress government wanted to actually sign a deal. So they created this Naga People's Convention, which was separate from the Naga National Council, which was the insurgent group. So they actually signed a pact, which is called a 16-point agreement, on the basis of which the Nagaland state was created. And when Nagaland state was created in the Constitution of India, Article 371 was, A was inserted, where I want to mention this because the uh, Constitution of India is beautiful. It's written that 
uh, land and its resources belongs to the people. So it's different there, you know, when you want to do a developmental like project, like a hydropower project, or there is oil, you know, in Nagaland, you want to explore that. Because the land and its resources belongs to the people and it's constitutionally enshrined, you have to take the permission of the local people because the customary law still rings supreme or and above other laws. So whether, and no act of parliament can be applicable to the state of Nagaland unless the assembly uh, passes the same act. So if, if you have Forest Rights Act, if you have any other act, it's not applicable to the state of Nagaland unless the assembly a, a allows that under Article 71A. So that was a sort of, a, you know, I mean, Ram, J Ram Jet Malani calls it a country within a country. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, that was an attempt to address the problem of insurgency. 1955, uh, 51 to 55, when Nehru was the uh, prime minister, actually he could have solved it then, but he was, I think, not so far-sighted as far as notice is concerned. And uh, he said, you know, I'll bomb the entire stretch of Naga Hills and shed any amount of blood, but I will not give an inch. I mean, it was not about an inch, right? So, for instance, a lot of us experienced that violence. Even my mother, he was, she was breastfed in the jungle because she was running away from the army. So a lot of people have that memory ingrained in their uh, mindset, you know. And, and I told you about the Naga culture. We don't have... We are warriors in the sense that we don't know the concept of surrender and all that. So the uh, insurgency still exists, persists today, because of uh, the fact that it's a political uh, issue. You know, in fact, a lot of generals. I was asking about Kuruk, you know, because of that. A lot of generals say that this is a political program problem. So for 25 years. Uh, the main insurgent groups have signed a ceasefire, and there's no, uh, you know, the f no fight like before. I remember in when we were in school, uh, any day there was going to there, there was a conflict where to go under the table or under bed, <laughs> because we don't know stray bullets might hit us. So that was a area uh, um, environment then. But today there is a relative calm and peace. Negotiations are going on at uh, you know. It, at various stages, it develops, but then because India is a big country, you know, there is no one size fits all. So a lot of negotiations, discussions, dialogues are happening unlike before. So there is a progress. There are some certain uh, landmark agreements which have been signed, uh, but to actually implement it on the ground, uh, it will require some time. Because you, if you look at the history of uh, small arms proliferation and trade in the entire northeastern region. You'll be amazed and you know surprised. It's huge. It's readily available. So how do you address all those issues while uh, negotiating for a political settlement? It's, it's and India is a, a democratic country. We want to solve issues through dialogue. You know. So I think times have changed. In the past. Uh, because of this conflict, there was this uh, rampant misuse of AFSPA, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. And uh, today, uh, you have seen that it has been removed from uh, most of the places where it's imposed. So at least for most of us, because of this peace process, relative calm, relative peace has come, and uh, there is absence of major conflict in the region. But there was another continues. question there. Yeah, uh, so you had mentioned that Subhash Chandra Bose was one of the factions. So I was also, I had actually read before in His Majesty's op Opponent by Sukhata Bose, mm. where he talks about um, Netaji's role in the in the siege of Koima, and he mentions that how some of the tribes considered him as a as a raja, and they were very enchanted by him. So I want to understand like how was the Indian National Army seen in the by the Nagas, and how did they come like was it that some section of the Nagas supported the Indian National Army and if that is so, then what is it that uh, led them to choose to go ahead with, to to unite with them, like you know, to join it? Like, how was the Indian National Army seen, being that it was from the mainland? 
I think um, that's a very interesting question because uh, firstly on Sugada Bose, I mean, you know, grand uncle, so you'll be, you will want to glorify him, you know, write good things about him, but it's not true. Um, there is one village which is still, uh, uh, you know, you would find people coming from all over India visiting that village where Subhash Chandra Bose is supposed to have state. I don't deny nor co confirm because, uh, you know, evidences are blurry. Even today, we do not know where he died, right? I mean, there's a lot of investigations going on. Yeah, and I've read a lot of material on that before actually writing about him. Because uh, mention must be made that his Indian National Army was called the Japanese Indian National Army by the British government here. And Nehru was a little confused about whether to support, uh, to, I mean, he was confused about a lot of Indians joining the British Army. Of course, uh, when you go to war, you are paid extra. So it was uh, for salary. It was for uh, you know, their livelihood that they joined the British Army. And they fought against the Japanese. Whereas uh, he went to Japan, and then he uh, actually declared his support. And that's how uh, the 50,000 troops of Indian National Army came there. So there was no conflict between the locals and Indian National Army. In fact, uh, you know. Even at that point of time, when they were there, there was no, there is no record, there is no discussion in the oral tradition also about, uh, oral history also, about any conflict with uh, members of the Indian National Army. They were treated as part of the Japanese, uh, you know, contingent. So whatever war happened was based on uh, which forces you were, which side of the, the divide you were, not as, uh, you know, INA or, you know, because from both sides, the soldiers were Indians only. Britishers, uh, just two, three, uh, you know, the uh, platoons yes, came, few officers came, you know. But of course, they're very good at taking credit. They're very good at propaganda, you know. So they were able to ensure for f 75 years that the role of Subhash Chandra Bose in the Battle of Kohima is, uh, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> relegated to that particular, you know, footnote of the second Battle of Kohima and Second World War. And because again here, both Gandhi and Nehru had some different opinion, you know. So if you look at the debates then within uh, the Indian Freedom Movement and the Indian uh, National Congress, and if you look at his role there, it's totally different. He wanted to liberate India from the British. Although I would like to point out, and many scholars have also written that he was also not a naive leader. He didn't believe that the Japanese will just hand over, after defeating uh, the British, hand over India to him. He also, may, he also had plans on how to take it forward, but unfortunately, they were defeated in Kohima. So the, see, actually, it's just a small place. If you come to Kohima, I was trying to highlight that. It's a small place where they fought, the mighty empires fought. So our people still say that it was not a war but we suffered the most, you know. And, uh, and therefore, if you look at Kohima, you would not imagine now. And we had, our people had not seen uh, airplanes. They were coming in thousands, I mean, hundred, every day they were coming, you know, and dropping these or that, ammunitions, food, you know. I mentioned about some million cigarettes being dropped in the Battle of Kohima and Infal. I mean, cigarettes, you know, nobody knew cigarettes, but. Uh, apparently, those days, instead of liquor, they give cigarettes for the soldiers so that they will uh, smoke it and, you know, control their anxiety or fear. So, Subhash Chandra Bose visit in that village called, uh, in Peg district, uh, is, is still written about. In fact, somebody uh, wrote to me saying that, uh, you know, you should have stated that Subhash Chandra Bose came there, you know. I said, according to evidences, there is rumor that he came there. But there is no actual factual account that he came there. So unless we actually find out, you know, we cannot mention that. But clearly, yeah. what he was regarded as the Nagas, that, that question doesn't even arise. Because we are not even sure yeah. if, he, if he came there. No, actually, he, is in, he was in touch with Pizzo in Rangoon. You know, Pizzo was in Rangoon. And the Japanese intelligence uh, agencies uh, actually was monitoring and guiding them. So they actually had some... Uh, uh, they were allies. They were part of the Japanese team. So they were together. But today, if you look at Bose, 
vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the Battle of Koyama and how Nagas regard them. I think there's not much about him. It's just that Bose is a big name, is a historical figure, is a national figure. That's why his role, even in the Battle of Koyama, even though it's minimal or, you know, uh, maybe not so significant, uh, is talked about. But there is a whole museum in uh, Imphal, in a place called Moirang, I think, uh, of the Indian National Army. There was another question here. Yeah. And okay. we'll come to you next after that. Okay, I'll stand up. Hello, Mr. Kikon. Nice yeah. to meet you again. Yeah. So my question is uh, relatively yes. personal. As a Mizo, uh, having oral tradition in the past, and we don't have written history like the Nagas. I'm curious as to because, uh, it, like today, uh, in our within our community, our historian have been trying to place where we come from, and now we relatively uh, can trace our history back to Cabo Valley in Manipur, and we probably came from China. Um, were a part of probably the Mongolian, you know, migration, wave of migration from Mongolia. So uh, is that a similar kind of estimation in your case? Where do the Nagas come from? Uh, yeah, it's not well, directly it's, related to the fine. books, I mean, uh, to your book, where do but yeah, where do, where do they come from? See, the origin theory is quite uh, dicey. I usually avoid uh, discussing this because there's not enough material uh, to to actually trace the origin, we know that we were uh, we settled in this present Naga Hills some thousand years ago. So we are very proud in saying that we came before the Ahoms. Ahoms came after us, but they ruled for six hundred years. Uh, super, super, actually excellent diplomacy, which enabled them to rule over the region. But then again, in fighting, you know ensure that the Burmese crushed them and also the British came then took over. So I think uh, the, the origin question has been is an ongoing scholarly uh, interest, but it's, um, I would say, you know, limited to uh, uh, scholarly circles and all that. I, I don't want to go into it without actually having you know, a, a very firm uh, knowledge of where we came from. There are theories, there are discussions, there are similarities. For instance, if you go to Yunnan province in China, there are a lot of similarities, there are a lot of discussions. But even in Myanmar, you know, which is like a uh, uh, you know, place where there's so many different communities, we will have, for instance, in one book by one Angami scholar, he has written that Angamis are closer to the Singpos and the Kachin. Singpos are in uh, Arunachal. So Singpos are the Kachins in uh, Myanmar. So they say that they are the, you know, closer. Then there is this oral tradition which says that uh, there is this Jantia uh, king whose brother fell in love with a niece. So they married and ran away to Dimapur. And uh, Angamis are offsprings of that. So there are so many theories. You know, you can't believe any. But uh, I, of course, have had interactions with a lot of anthropologists who uh, study the origin theory, and uh, there are so many stories. I just recently read, you know, because um, at least in India, the privilege of studying uh, indigenous communities and uh, their, you know, past, their culture is very vibrant. We get to know about uh, that origin theory. But there's definitely uh, many cultures across this region have similarities. But you see, there are headhunters in Borneo. Doesn't mean that Nagas and uh, Mizos, Mizos are also headhunters, uh, are, are related to you know somebody in Borneo. I mean, it's far fetched. There was another question here, gentlemen. Oh, hi, yeah. Good evening. Uh, nice to meet you, and uh, thank you for a lovely talk. Um, I was just wondering. You, you're saying obviously that the uh, the Naga contribution to the Battle of Kohima is undervalued. And um, recently there was a, a film a few years back called 1917. It's a fantastic film about the First World War, very shocking, very well uh, made. And I remember there was some commentators in Britain saying that it was too woke because, oh my gosh, in the middle of the battlefield in France, there's some Sikh soldiers. And people uh, in, in the UK are very unaware of India's uh, soldiers' contribution you know, to the, to the, the world, wars. world Wars. So I was just wondering, were you aware of any uh, Naga soldiers fighting in the First World War for the British? 
Yeah, I can even give you uh, photos of uh, the griefs of Naga soldiers in pa uh, France. I don't know which particular area, but uh, they actually went to France. You know, I just, I want to make this point, and I used to tell uh, our historians that they may have gone as labor corps. They may have gone carried, you know, because we are hardy people. We can climb mountains, we can survive without, you know. Uh, and this is also on the basis of culture. You know, If I tell my friend, Brahmin friend in Delhi, that I can eat anything that moves except vehicle and human beings, you know. <laughs> they'll be, you know, I mean, they'll be shocked, you know, I can eat anything. And uh, I always narrate this uh, story about how in China in those days, the zoology textbook tells you about which animal to eat for which ailment. So we actually, in our oral culture, actually talk about that in our communities. You know. And I know for a fact that because of our migratory past, because of our nomadic past, and uh, before we settled here, we had to go through a lot of, uh, you know, uh, terrains which were difficult. We had to survive and, and before uh, we settled here. So recently, when, and I'm coming back to that, when uh, the Indian Reserve Battalion from Nagaland were sent to, this is uh, 2000, 1999 to 2001, they were sent to Chhattisgarh uh, in a place called Bastar to fight the Maoist. So the chief minister said that I want the Naga battalion to be stationed here forever. You know, every year he will write a letter to Nagaland government asking us to send our soldiers there. Because our soldiers could adapt to the mountains there. And if you send the Naga soldiers for operation, they will be able to, according to him, survive longer than any other forces because they can eat anything. Of course, he didn't mention the fact that our boys went and uh, stole all the cattle of the, you know, the <laughs> Adivasis there, you know, was a terror themselves and they enjoyed uh, fighting because they, for them it was like hunting, you know, because they were dropped by a chopper in a lo uh, certain location and they enjoyed fighting, you know. And this is government sanctioned fighting, right? They're not like... <laughs> They are asked to fight, so they are enjoying the fighting there. So Raman Singh was appreciative of the boys because, you know, they could survive without any complaint of food. No? Because, but he didn't uh, mention the fact that he, the, the Nagas kill all the fowls, all the pigs, cows, and dogs are a delicacy, and, and the monkeys in the jungle, you know. While uh, shooting at the nuxels, they'll also shoot a uh, monkey, you know. So, I mean, all those things were there, but in... Uh, in a war, whether you're a labor or whether you're a soldier, you're facing the same bullet. So there is a lady who has done a study on uh, the first labor corps from Nagaland to uh, fight, in fight in the First World War, and they went to Paris. They've never seen a foreign country. They've never flown in a plane, and they went by plane. You know, headhunters went by plane, uh, they used to, the spears and the out there, they saw a different world, different weaponry, you know, and their entire worldview changed. A lot of them are buried there because they could not bring the, you know, um, dead bodies. Right. Any other questions? We have time, I think, for one more, one more question, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Last question. Uh, we went for the Hornbill Festival, and uh, every tribe, when? a Hornbill Festival. When was when, this? When? Uh, four or five years ago. And uh, uh, every tribe, every Naga tribe had a representation there. So they had uh, these kind of uh, like houses, which was replicated uh, of what they actually have. And, uh, and they also had the cuisine in those houses which you could sample and eat or make a meal of it also. So um, uh, there's, uh, just, just wanted to let you know that. There's no question here. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> By way of information. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this discussion as much as I have. I think it's been an eye-opener to me in uh, many different ways. Uh, the book 
I would highly recommend. Uh, I don't know. It's it's a portal to a world that we didn't know existed, and I think it's a story that we all must know. It's a culture that I think we all must understand, and uh, you know, and in in some sense, I think within our within our country, there is so much diversity, and you know, this 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 book and the story is something of an eye opener in that sense as well. So, Mon Lumo, I really want to uh, say my deep, deep, deep thanks to you know, uh, I mean, for this very, very informative, very, very educational uh, talk that you have given us, uh, and I hope that the book. You know, uh, travels far and wide, and more people know this uh, very important, very earth-shaking story, I should say, and give it its due place in our narration of world history and Indian history in particular. So, may I request you to give a big hand, Thank a Bangalore <laughs> appreciation to Mon Lumo Kikor. Thank you. <clears throat>